So there is this old saying, right? An ounce of prevention is worth more than a pound of cure, right? Great stuff, great Pulitzer Prize winning stuff, but I wanna ask this. What happens if the prevention cannot be prevented? Like murder, and the only thing that is being prevented is actually the cure by the people that are supposed to be administering this cure. And today we're gonna revisit the 24-year-old cold case of the Setagaya murders, the Miyazawa family murders. And to me, this case feels warm. A cold case that feels warm because I do believe that this case should have already been solved and I have no doubt that it will be solved. It can be argued with a lot of countries, even our countries, that the wheels of justice, they just move too slowly. But when it's concerning Japan and DNA forensic science, the wheel is not even spinning. And we'll get into the weeds of all that. And let's just put it this way. As an American, it's not my place to judge and say what another country should be doing legally right especially when our country recognizes japan as a level one country and that's only reserved for the safest countries on the planet so coming from a country that deals with mass shootings or whatnot i guess yeah we, we don't have a, a leg to stand on but at the same time i'm pretty sure it's no consolation for the loved ones of the miyazawa family that they live in the safest country on the planet when four of their family members and the youngest was six years old is slaughtered and that's why we're gonna solve the case right guys we're gonna do our best to give as much detail as possible and i do want the comment section to be just relegated to people fact checking this video fact checking me i don't want to get anything wrong for you guys to include and add more information and have a fruitful dialogue right this is just one step closer because this case can be solved i feel like it just needs a person that thinks outside the box that views this case just differently because how it's been viewed thus far has gotten us to where we are today which is unsolved i'd like you to meet mikio miyazawa He's a 30-year-old office worker for a London-based branding company called Interbrand in Tokyo. It was a well-paying job and it was interesting enough to Mikio, but his true interest was in science fiction books and movies and especially anime. He was also very active in set designs of local theaters, so if we're to go by stereotypes, you can say that he was careening down the path of a lonely virgin, but then he met the lovely Yasuko. She's a 28 year old cosmetician that found his quirks adorable and she just she basically respected who he was and needless to say the two would fall in love and when that happens it's time to meet the parents. So Mikio brings his new girlfriend home to meet his mother Setsuko and she just adores Yasuko. She loves the girl. She said that when she first met her, she was just stunning. She was respectful and the mother knew that she was just going to make her son Mikio very happy. So they got that blessing. And of course, there's just one more major hurdle and it was a major one because that would be Yasuko's mom, Haruko. And why it was so important it was because the two were very close okay the daughter and the mom they would confide in each other every day speak every day and so technically her opinion could actually make or break the whole relationship so you could imagine the nervousness mikio felt going into this meeting and the pure elation when haruko approved of mikio she could see that he was going to be a good provider for his family. She could clearly see the smile on her daughter's face, how happy this young man made her little Yasuko. So in 1986, they got married and were now Mr. and Mrs. Miyazawa. So five years of adventures in marriage would just fly by and their bond and dedication to each other that would only grow and people that knew them would always describe them as being so good together and of course happy and so the only thing that would be missing from this equation now 
is a little one. So they began to plan. Now Yasugo had an older sister and her name was Anne and she had a little son and a husband and at the time they were living outside of Japan and they would be outside for the next few years on business so that family they owned a duplex in the Kami Soshigaya street of Setagaya city in Tokyo and being that now half of it was vacant she offered it to her sister and Mikio and it was located in a great neighborhood very nice not too opulent and most importantly reasonably priced which was great for their finances which is perfect for Mikio who was an avid bookkeeper I don't know if he was a penny pincher but he kept the receipts of everything a trait that his mother Setsugo said that even as a kid he would just jot down everything he purchased and made sure everything was balanced and it was definitely perfect for Yasuko because guess who was occupying the other half of this duplex her mother Haruko and not only that but there was this popular park Soshigaya Park also known as Choo Choo Train Park just behind their house and they're planning a family and that was just a sign right it appeared that things were lining up perfectly for the Miyazawas so by 1991 Yasuko was fully pregnant and she would leave her job in the cosmetics world because she wanted to be home with the baby and she was a great homemaker according to Mikio's mom Setsuko and a wonderful mother and wife and Yasuko wasn't one to just stop working because she was pregnant she wanted to make sure her growing family had what they needed for those you know rainy days that you don't see coming so she started what is called a cram school which is tutoring kids for exams and she would do this in her mom's house which was more spacious than the cramped layout in the other half of the duplex that they were living in and as her stomach grew so did the money in the cram school till and soon they delivered their baby girl and they named her Nina now Nina was a very happy respectful child and also very social and full of energy and most of that energy was dispelled by dancing she just loved dancing she said that when she grew up she wanted to do ballet now two years later they welcomed in another new member a boy they named Ray and unfortunately their son showed early signs of developmental issues such as learning and speech disabilities and the Miyazawas found that even though he struggled with this he still loved books just like his dad loved books and his favorite subject was dinosaurs and being that Mikio really wanted to encourage reading he would sit down with Ray any chance he gets with a good dinosaur book and read it to Ray. He was described as a really sweet boy and the joy of everybody's day. So over the years the Miyazawas watched as their district of about 200 homes when they first moved in it started to dwindle as people were selling off their properties to the city of Tokyo. So anybody who sold that land to Tokyo, Tokyo would demolish that property you know to expand the park and by the winter of 2000 there were ramps and rails and half pipes or whatever they call it. It technically was a full-fledged skate park behind the Miyazawa's house and the family just watched as their once robust neighborhood now only consisted of about four to six houses and this fact would play a pivotal role in how detectives would actually try to unravel this case interesting to mention okay i'll add in here that the year prior to this which would be 1999 a disturbing number of cats were found dead in the park 13 cats over the course of the year were found by horrified park goers because they were obviously murdered some were boiled in hot oil some had sulfuric acid poured on them or sprayed at them what they thought with possibly a water gun in general they were mutilated tortured and even poisoned and it was reported of course to the Tokyo Metropolitan Police but was generally left unaddressed and I take this story as you will because it may not have anything to do with the case but I don't know 
maybe it does. So let's move on to the next year. So that would be the year 2000, okay? That would make Mikio 44, Yasuko is 41, Nina is 8, and Rei is 6. Now, Yasuko's older sister Anne, remember she was out of the country? Well, her and her family are now moving back, and they would move in with their mother, Haruko next door and now essentially within this little duplex they had their own happy little community within the community kids could visit grandma they could go over and watch tv with their aunt and uncle and then go with their cousin to the park right in their backyard and by december 25th the family was gathered together to celebrate this secular japanese christmas together and even mikio's mother setsuko would stop by and it was just a very happy time for the family but this would turn out to be setsuko's last memories of her son and his family that same day yasuko noticed something odd a car that she didn't recognize parked right in front of the duplex. She thought nothing of it until the following day when she noticed it parked there again. She tells Mikio, but you know, raising an alarm about a car that she saw two days in a row might be a bit much, but Yasuko was unsettled enough that she mentioned it to her mother as well. But of course, it's not illegal to just park, right? It's just annoying for the residents. So Yasuko probably felt silly and just left it at that. Now, the following day, on the 27th, neighbors took notice of a man they had not seen before walking their street and they described his mannerism as being odd because they said that it appeared that he was pretending to be a passerby and would wind up passing by the Miyazawa house several times. Now just know that in this case there are thousands of reports made by the public and they turned out not to be fruitful and some could not be corroborated or proven and yet they were just not fruitful and these are just a few of those and so yeah, take these with a grain of salt is what I'm trying to tell you. It was reported that on the 29th, neighbors noticed a man wearing clothes that did not fit the cold weather walking down their streets and to them the man, he had to have been crazy to be dressed that way but was it the same man from the day before? Now we move to the following day and a similar man again was seen around the vicinity of the Sengawa railway station which is about 11 kilometers away from Setagaya which is about six miles to us Americans and I'll say again these may mean nothing. So around 5 to 6 p.m., Mikio and Ray went on a 15-minute walk to the Setagaya Shotengai, which is a street lined with shops, of course, to do a little shopping. The family car was being used by Yasuko to pick up photos from a processing shop. Now, neighbors did notice that the Miyazawa family car was away for at least an hour, but by 7 p.m., the family was all completely back having dinner inside. And after dinner, Nina would go next door to visit grandma and watch TV. At about 9.30 p.m., she said goodnight to everyone and went home. Okay, so now all of the Miyazawa family are back inside the house and this is when the nightmare begins. And I will say before we begin, like a lot of unsolved crimes, it's not going to be 100% known what has happened for the simple fact that even detectives don't even know fully what happened. And I will be telling the most common version of this story, but I will be adding an, an I guess an uncommon amount of detail and even graphic detail. So if this doesn't pass, you know, the YouTube policies, I'll have to figure out a way in editing to tone it down so I won't get dinged by YouTube. But for my Patreons, you know, who get early access to these videos anyways, they will also get the uncensored version because we can. And that's just to make you guys aware of my Patreon. And if you like these Japanese true crimes, I have another one on there, an exclusive one. So hop on by. Maybe it's only $5. Cancel anytime. Shameless plug over. At 10 p.m., neighbors thought they heard an argument between Yasuko and Mikio, and of course that is a rarity for the couple, and it 
was described as truly not a heated argument, though voices were raised and people passing by could hear them. Now, the fact that this argument happened would add another layer of mystery going forward, so just keep it in mind and we'll get to it, okay? So, before bed, Yasuko and Mikio would always double, triple check to see if the front door was locked and, you know, the rest of the house was secure. And at 10.38, Mikio would finally sit down at his work computer and log into his work email, which was located on the first floor of the house. Now, Ray, we could assume, is already asleep in his bed on the second floor, and Yasuko and Nina, who slept in the attic, should probably be turning in as well at this point. And besides the glow of the computer on Mikio's face, the rest of the house was at rest and quiet. And this is when the monster snuck in. Rei Miyazawa was sound asleep. In the bathroom adjacent to his room, the screen of the bathroom window was pried off and fell two stories with a thud. The window slowly slid open and a thin person slithered through the narrow window and into the bathroom. Ray didn't hear the footsteps that entered his room, didn't feel the two hands. Ray was only six. He didn't have a chance. But he did create enough of a disturbance to make his father Mikio downstairs look away from his computer screen. Mikio thought he heard something. Maybe Ray was awake and walking around. So he decided to go upstairs and check. By the time Mikio climbed to the top of the stairs, he was met by an intruder. A knife cut into Mikio's thigh and suddenly he was in the fight of his life and that of his family and he fought valiantly. He was able to injure this assailant who was now bleeding as well. But the monster, he was armed with this long sashimi knife and was able to land critical strikes to Mikio's chest, both arms, and legs. The blood loss was just too much for Mikio, which allowed the killer to jam the sashimi knife deep into Mikio's skull and break off the blade. Mikio fell backwards down the steps and at the foot of it expired. A flash of anger came over the monster realizing that he too had been injured. He goes down the stairs to Mikio's lifeless body and begins and once he felt satisfied he goes back up the stairs to the second floor and here's something in the attic. He finds the folding stairs that leads straight up to it and rapidly climbs up. He finds Yasuko and Nina in the corner holding each other, terrified. He rushes at them in a frenzied knife attack. Yasuko and Nina are badly wounded. His dominant right hand is severely cut as the blood made his grip slip across the blade, cutting through his thick gloves and into his flesh. He switches to his left hand, but soon realizes that he had underestimated how hard a mother is going to fight for her child. He's basically failed and starts scurrying back down the stairs. Yasuko's attention immediately goes to her daughter Nina who is bleeding profusely. She has sustained critical stab wounds. Yasuko immediately grabs some bed sheets and starts wrapping Nina up hoping to quell the bleeding. And she knew that if she didn't do something immediately, her child was going to die anyways. So she's gonna take a chance. With the last bit of her strength, she carries Nina and goes back down the stairs. But the monster was down there waiting. He was now holding a sentoku knife he found in the kitchen. Eight-year-old Nina at this point was holding on by a thread and we could only hope that her last memory wasn't of the killer. We know also at some point
and it was over. So now at this point, the killer's right hand is bleeding badly. He goes into the kitchen and he takes off the gloves. He finds some napkins and bandages to wrap the deep gash now in his hand. And here's where it gets a little bit bizarre. Okay, so he makes himself at home, it seems. He would help himself to a few pieces of melons that he would find. He opened the freezer, found four little containers of ice cream, and without using a spoon, he would just squeeze them into his mouth and enjoy them, I guess. He would then go into the refrigerator and he would find some beer or whatnot, other types of drinks, but he chose barley tea on top of all those to wash it down with. And at this point, his body must have been in shock, you know, from the blood loss and probably felt a little lightheaded. He goes on over to the family couch and he lays down. Now, whether he took a nap or was just waiting for his body to recuperate, we don't know. But what we do know is, by 1.18 a.m., he was up and walking around again. He would go back downstairs, past Mikio's body, and he started surfing the internet on Mikio's computer for about five minutes. He would even visit some of Mikio's bookmarks that he had. And randomly, the killer created a folder for no apparent reason. He would then rummage through the drawers and find some family documents and innocuous documents. Remember, Mikio was an avid bookkeeper and he would keep receipts, medical records, etc. And for some reason, the killer is compelled to hold on to these papers. He would go to the bathroom upstairs. He would fill up the tub with water and just start discarding the papers into it. And then suddenly, he had the urge to take a shit, and afterwards he didn't even bother to flush. Because hey, his DNA was everywhere anyways, he wasn't gonna clean that up. So, what's a few more, you know, pieces of evidence for the cops anyways? After leaving the bathroom, he begins to basically snoop around the house. He finds the cram school till, takes some of the money, and leaving the rest behind. He finds two of Yasuko's purses, goes through them, keeps various personal items, you know, like her ID. He finds Mikio's wallet and the house keys, and then he heads back to that same bathroom. With his shit still in it, he tosses all these items he's just found into that toilet. He goes back to the kitchen, grabs a towel, wipes off some more blood, grabs another ice cream, and by the time he gets back to the toilet, he throws in the towel, the bloody towel, and finishes the ice cream, throws in the empty cup all into the toilet. And at this point, I guess it's time to leave. Now, he knew he couldn't go outside completely covered in blood, so he found some of Mikio's clothes, put them on. He had pretty much taken off everything that he had worn and didn't even bother taking it with him, which didn't seem very difficult to do and simply walks out the front door and disappears at around 10 a.m. the following morning. Grandma Haruko calls her daughter Yasuko to see what the plans were gonna be for the day. It was gonna be New Year's and they were planning to celebrate together. And oddly, no one answers the phone. Haruko immediately heads over, lets herself in, and of course, what she finds would just leave this dark cloud over the remainder of her life. She would see her son-in-law dead on the floor in a pool of blood with a blade clearly sticking out of his head. In pure shock, she knocks over the mouse of the computer and rushes upstairs to see just more horror. Her beloved Yasuko and her grandchild Nina back to back in a pool of blood as well, and the same fate as Mikio. But where was Rei? She rushed to the bedside, and there was a glimmer of hope. I mean, there was no blood around the boy, but the heartbreak was complete when she realizes that he too is not breathing. So the case as it stands today is listed as a robbery homicide and the plethora of information I'm about to give you, I encourage you to make your own judgment. Be creative, 
because everything that we have so far hasn't been able to solve the case, right? We could just put it that way. So let's start with what the Tokyo detectives first thought happened. And it's, it's a solid theory based on tangible evidence, okay? So they figured that the perp came in through the second story bathroom window in this picture that I'm gonna show you here. And it's easy to see why because the window was open and the screen was taken off. They discovered footprints in the damp soil below with broken twigs and they believed that that belonged to the killer before he made his climb. Now, he would have had to climb the nearby fence, possibly using the nearby tree in some manner, and from there he would have to find his footing on this circuit box, remove the screen, open the window, and wiggle his way in so the perpetrator would have had to have been very agile and at the same time fairly small to execute this scenario which of course makes them suspect that it was someone young and since this bathroom shared walls with Ray it made sense why they figured that the first victim was the young boy and of course there was no blood in or around him as well here's an issue that isn't addressed from all my readings and that is screaming and yelling that it that must have happened right considering this is a violent knife attack so back to when that argument that the miyazawas were having you know, so if that statement is true, then the screams must have been heard by anyone in the vicinity. Now, given maybe nobody was in the vicinity, although I know I read somewhere that Mikio did put insulation in, you know, the wall between the two duplexes because of, you know, voices traveling through the walls or whatnot. So if he did that, then if the house was secure and all the windows were closed or whatnot, then maybe there screams were muffled then there is the thud that one of the family members next door heard coming from the miyazawas now it's speculated that it was the folding staircase coming down and hitting the floor with a thud now if they could hear that thud then wouldn't they definitely hear the screams of a woman and a child or even mikio you know i'd assume or could the thud have been made when the window screen hitting the ground two stories down after being removed by the killer. So by the time he's cleaned up and put on Mikio's clothes, he was leaving no more traces of evidence, you know? So we don't actually know how he got out of the house. I said that he simply walked out the front door, which is possible and which would probably be the most common sense way to leave the house. Why would you go back out that narrow bathroom window and arguably, yes, it's it seems much harder to get out of that window than sneaking in considering the two story drop. And then there's this balcony, you right, from Ray's room that he could have came out of, you know, found footing on the family car and just disappeared. But if you're going to do all that, you know, front facing, why not just walk out the door? That's less conspicuous, I would think. And if that mysterious car that Yasuko saw on Christmas Day and the day after, then it would make sense that he would still have a car and simply drove away. And like I mentioned before, there are thousands and thousands of reports or speculations that filled the Tokyo PD's lines. And this is just a couple of those rumors and sightings, okay? So one cab driver claimed that three men with one man injured got in into his car and when they left they had left a blood stain on his seat if that's true is it possible that there were three killers that it was a group effort then there's actual surveillance of a man simply buying just one sashimi knife but that too would be followed up with the tokyo pd saying that that man had nothing to do with it so i guess they followed up on it and there's so much more instances that you know wound up being unfruitful so we won't spend any more time on those and now let's talk about the things that the killer left behind and together it would actually tell a very unique story that we just can't crack 
So on that living room sofa, police find a gray knitted bucket hat that they would also call a crusher hat, a black padded air tech jacket by Uniglo that had traces of bird shit on it and also these Zelkova leaves that are found in Japan and also willow leaves. So take that as you will. And the gloves that he was wearing was black and made by a company called Edwin. And now these items, they were all sold in Japan and all were considered unremarkable in terms of leads now these next items that we're going to talk about are remarkable so there is this black handkerchief and it's wrapped around the base of that sashimi knife that is now broken he discarded that as well he didn't bother taking that either and but the way that it was wrapped they said it was in a manner of chinese factory workers at fish markets and stuff like that and you know they did that so that the knife would have a better grip and it's also been known to be used by the philippines Simply meaning that this wasn't common practice by Japanese natives to wrap their knives like that. Then there was this green plaid pattern scarf. It was basic, it was made of acrylic, there was no manufacturer, no... It was pretty generic, right? And definitely cheap. And the police, they found that this scarf could be found at certain events. You know, they were being given away you know, at game centers, arcades, and can also be purchased at uniform stores, places that younger people usually go. Then to match, there was also a green hip bag or fanny pack to us Americans. And th this was also manufactured in Japan, in Osaka, and it was produced between 1995 and 1999. So it was only in production for four years, which would give a time frame for when he purchased this item and it will come into play that the purchase of this item is kind of important now this bag is described as fairly large okay it could hold a small laptop it was said in the police report and apparently a long ass sashimi knife could fit in it too but it was what was in the bag that had detectives believing that this case would be solved in no time and there were four things in this bag. And the first thing was they would find short, dark brown to black strands of hair, which most likely belonged to the killer. Now, detectives also noticed this fluorescent markings on the bag and on some of the clothing. Okay, now this marking was from a highlighter they discovered. You know, highlighters that are only used by kids in school. So this had detectives leaning again towards a young suspect, you know, one that could be around as young as 15 years old. And next they would find these fiberglass materials. And it turns out to be consistent with something called grip tape, which is used by skaters for their boards. And hey, there's skaters behind the house. It was all starting to fit, right, for the detectives? Then they found something that just didn't make sense at all, okay? The fourth thing they found were grains of sand. Sand that turns out when they check the database. There is a sand database all around the world. They could not find this sand in Tokyo. As a matter of fact, they could not find this sand in all of Japan. And I'm being dead serious. When I learned where this sand was tracked to it gave me the chills guys and i'm dedicating a whole section of this video to this sand so we'll get to that very shortly so two detectives things were starting to align like i was telling you okay the miyazawas lived next to a skate park and the killer's clothing hey it looked like skater clothing. And interestingly, the Japanese skateboarding community is actually pretty popular in Japan. And like I mentioned before, the city was looking to expand the once choo-choo train park into a skate park with ramps and all. So when you have people skateboarding, you know, right next to your house, it could be very loud, right? I, I assume that it's nonstop, <laughs> okay? so. I can only imagine how annoying it is, especially if you're trying to sleep, if you're a responsible adult trying to wake up for work, that if the skaters didn't respect the hours, that that would be a big problem. The skaters, as a matter of fact, didn't 
always respect the hours of the residents, and they would skate well into the night, and this made detectives wonder if there was any issues between the residents and the skaters because of this, and lo and behold, not only were there plenty of noise complaints, but reports of a verbal altercation with Mikio Miyazawa himself with the skaters. And most likely unknown to Mikio, some of these skaters were part of a motorcycle gang called Bosu Zoku, and they hung out at the park as well. Now, the question is, did Mikio anger the wrong person? So with this, detectives started to paint their pictures of the killer. So they had in their sights a male about 15 to 25 years old. He's 170 centimeters, which is about 5'6 in height. He's got to be athletic. He's got to be thin. And he's a skater with possible gang ties and war. Drakkar Noir Aftershave. So get this, guys. There was a skater back in the day named Christian Hasoy, and he was a legend to all the skaters, it seems. So whatever Hasoy did was so cool that everyone who was a skater as well copied him. And at one point in his career, Hasoy became the brand ambassador for the French aftershave Drakkar Noir. Now, he would even visit Japan a few times, and soon all the Japanese skaters smelled like Jack Noir. Now, this held a lot of weight for the detectives because the discarded clothing smelled like Jack Noir, and so a dragnet of sorts of the skating community was cast, and you know, countless of them would be interrogated, if not all the skaters that had a connection to. Uh, Choo Choo Train Park, you know, or been associated in some way or some fingers pointed here and there, anybody they get their hands on would be fingerprinted. And so as time went on, you know, with every fingerprint that didn't match, you know, any DNA that didn't hit, the case began to stall. And here's something I found interesting, okay, all the skaters that were exonerated, you know, they would tell the police that the clothes that they found they didn't even look like skater clothes. It looked like skater clothes to you old policemen, <laughs> but to them in the community, those were whack, right? Those weren't something that they would wear. And look at those shoes. What are those, right? They were from a British company called Slazengers, which only sold these particular nine and a halves, which is Japanese 11s. They would only sell these shoes in South Korea. So that was a pretty much a breakthrough for the detectives to learn this. They sent over the DNA to South Korea. They sent the fingerprints over to South Korea. No match. The thing that also baffled them was they had that DNA sequenced and it suggested that the killer actually was Korean. And the fact that they couldn't get a match on the prints was mind boggling. But here's an interesting fact about South Korea. And that is they fingerprint all their citizens when they reach a certain age they fingerprint all the visitors as well so if you've ever been to south korea they're holding on to your fingerprints that's gonna sit in their database forever so when the fingerprints that japan had sent them came back with no match it's almost a guarantee that the killer had never even been to south korea so then how did he get those shoes that were only sold there in size 11s? Well, turns out that you could also mail order them in our good old US of A. And this would be the correct, perfect time to talk about the sand. So it's no ordinary sand. As a matter of fact, it was sand that could only be found in this small city in California of about 14,000 people. And that city is called California City. Now the town itself wasn't the intrigue though. It was the Air Force Base that was next to it. Edwards Air Force Base. And here you guys need to listen to the podcast called Faceless by a crime author named Nicholas Oberjean. And it's great. It's, it's a wonderful podcast that I use to fact check some of this information, garner some information. This information about the sand, Nick, 
went over to the Air Force base risking arrest and gathered some of that sand so that he could send to his soil specialist. Guys, it's, it's an amazing podcast. He was obsessed with this case for two years, which is a long time to drive yourself crazy over a case, and I respect it wholeheartedly. So if you guys find this story very intriguing, then you gotta listen to The Faceless Podcast. And I wanna reiterate again, okay, that because we all think differently, it might just take one small clue, one thing that only you, you, realize that this case it can be solved mikio's mother satsuko she's still alive guys and her last wish is that the killer be brought to justice you know before she passes some justice for her son and his family okay some fun sand fact that i learned from the faceless podcast and that's in just a teaspoon of sand you get more organisms in that sample of sand then there are people on our planet today now that's what makes sand so unique and why there is such a thing called forensic soil science and it's why a few grains of sand in tokyo japan was pinpointed all the way across the world to a very specific area in california it turns out edwards air force base has a direct link to yakota which is a U.S. Japanese airbase in Tokyo near Setagaya. Pretty creepy, isn't it? And at the same time, it complicates the case even more because now what exactly are we talking about here? That the killer is possibly an American-born Japanese or Korean or Chinese and in a further stretch Filipino that was in the U.S. Air Force or just some random that visited around that area, collected some Nevada sand, and flew off to kill an entire family. And also considering the time frame in which the production of the fanny pack was 95 to 99, his four year window that the killer, he went to go buy the fanny pack in Japan, be in California to get sand into it, fly back to Japan, commit this atrocious murder that possibly the killer who is still out there if he hadn't already died might be in my own backyard. And so now you have so many moving parts that it just, you know, complicates things for even one theory to go right. It has to satisfy now the American soil that is involved and so much time has elapsed that possibly didn't need to and I just can't help but feel that this case should have been solved already and you might feel the same way about this because of the final thing that the killer left behind. Blood. His DNA was everywhere, especially on the items that he discarded. Now. With this, they knew his blood type was A, and that he was likely Korean rather than Japanese with Mediterranean ancestry. So, if you've heard of the Golden State Killer case, then you know that the police sat on that man's DNA for 40 years until technology advanced enough to start linking people through genealogy, a giant genealogy database. So. They didn't even need the DNA of the killer on file. They just needed blood of the relatives in that day. Well, I shouldn't say blood. DNA, because, you know, saliva. In that database, and they could form this family branch and connections. Okay, so fascinating stuff and kind of scary at the same time. Big brothers watching, yada, yada. But guys, be thrilled at the same time because we get to witness this sort of brave new world of forensic science that could solve a bunch of cold cases going forward. So then the obvious question is, well, why aren't they doing this for the Miyazawa family? And this is when the case gets frustrating, you know, in a nutshell. Japan does not allow scientists to build a DNA profile to identify someone. They only allow the most basic method, DNA matching. So only when the culprit shows up in their system again by committing a crime, only then will they be able to match it. So 
why they don't profile is boiled down to cultural beliefs and of course Japanese love their privacy your DNA is your DNA so mainly ethical and cultural implications and we have to respect this even paternity tests in Japan aren't straightforward because they believe in family values over that of even being related okay so example if a man refuses to take a paternity test no one could force him to take it and he is by default deemed the father kind of sounds weird in America to us Americans some argue that DNA testing prioritizes genetic relatedness over other conceptions of parent child relationship and the broader ethical and legal deliberation is needed so that can give you a sense of where they're coming from and you know what I respect it frustrating but I get it and for the astute that has been listening and caught my little contradiction okay I said earlier that the DNA they found was likely from a Korean and Mediterranean descent well how would they be able to know that without DNA profiling and you my little budding detective would be right so Japan will not allow you to build a DNA profile to be used to point fingers okay but they do use DNA profiling and they simply sit on the information it's kind of crazy right so the fact that we even know that much about the killer is only because someone possibly someone fed up in the forensic department of why this case isn't getting solved is because it was leaked to the press the Japanese system is archaic and by design as we mentioned before the forensics department is even prohibited to advance their skills meaning they're not even allowed to ask like fellow colleagues from other countries that are in the same field such as American scientists or anyone in the world as a matter of fact regarding their methods of DNA science and so as a result the Japanese way of sequencing DNA is said to be outdated by as much as 30 years and so again from the faceless podcast Nix talks with a Colleen Fitzpatrick and she's a forensic genealogist that pioneered the way DNA is used to solve violent crimes and cold cases and she says pretty much because the Japanese method is so outdated that the presumption that the killer is Korean with Mediterranean ancestry might not hold as much water as believed and it doesn't necessarily mean that the Tokyo PD is wrong it's the simple fact that all humans have all sorts of markers in our DNA stemming back thousands and thousands of years meaning that the killer could have had Mediterranean in his bloodstream stemming all the way back to his great 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 super great 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 grandma on his mother's side but by the time it got to him he would simply look Japanese so the idea that he is mixed race is technically true she doesn't want you to think that he would necessarily look mixed and this is what Colleen had to say about what she could do with DNA today with genetic genealogy we use a different kind of marker called a SNP which is more of a point on the DNA and as a consequence when you get tested you get tested on 500,000 or 600,000 points and it becomes not so much a one-to-one -one match but how much how many of these points you share with other people in the database the more you share the closer you're related the less you share the more distant you're related so when i see my results it'll be a list of people who share dna with me and it's like a big sudoku puzzle i'll see a first cousin a third cousin a second cousin once removed an aunt and uncle i won't know who these people are but i'll find out and i'll figure out how they related to me based on how much dna they share and then it's up to me to put that sudoku puzzle together so it all makes sense the police could send me the Y profile on the on the case and I could compare that to the genetic genealogy databases to possibly find a last name for this guy um, even if I could not find a last name I could probably say the ethnicity which would be East Asian but I might be able to get a nationality which would be a step forward which they don't have right now all they could needed to do would be send me the results you know a PDF file or an Excel spreadsheet and I could work with that it would take me no time at all. I would search the genetic genealogy, Y DNA databases. I have software to do that. Any piece of intelligence, investigative intelligence, is worth it. 
you know, it takes you one step closer. Okay. It's worth it. So there's this lab in the U.S. called Parabon, and I've done another case where they help solve a crime, and they develop this technology that can read what is called DNA blueprint, giving you a physical appearance of the person, ancestral background, eye color, hair color, and even the face shape, which could narrow down the field a lot, especially for a cold case that have been stuck in limbo for years. They can produce a three-dimensional person with the right skin color, the right eye color, hair color, even down to freckles. And then they'll have a composite that scientists at Parabon are 99% confident will look like the suspect you are looking for and that's fucking unbelievable but don't think japan doesn't already know this in the end like i said before it's a cultural battle because privacy is sacred okay even for a monster that murders an entire family just before new year's your blood, your DNA, that's private. So in a country that is considered one of the most technologically advanced on this entire planet, due to their belief system, they happen to fall short in the forensic science department. In this case alone, it's been estimated that 280,000 different policemen have been involved in this case. That's a lot of hours spent on this case. And we're still here. This is Takashi Sushida. He was the police chief when the Miyazawa family was murdered. And it's the one case that haunts him even 20 plus years later. He's in his late 70s now, and he's been a proponent of the change in the legal framework to allow DNA to be used, you know, for certain criminal cases, such as horrific murders, like the Miyazawa case. And it's not only for the parents and the children that were murdered, but, you know, for the people that love them. Mikio's mother, Setsuko, whom he visits on occasion, you know, to bring her food and pray at the family shrine. He's even pleaded on Japanese news channels for the change and the archaic wheels of the Japanese justice system turns at a snail's pace if it's turning at all really and so if you've made it this far I thank you so much and please hit the like button you know for the algorithm and hopefully it'll help you see me for my next video so now I'm gonna give my own theory on what happened that night and there are some things in my version that I did not see anyone else mention okay it's not to toot my own horn or whatnot or maybe I didn't dig deep enough into the rabbit hole of the internet to see it but I promise you I actually do believe I came up with this but anyways so the culprit in my scenario is on the lower age range. Remember, that's 15 to 25, so I'm picking, I guess, 15 to 18, okay? You know, for the car sake, right? Because the kid was driving, and in Japan, I do believe 18 is the driving age. I know it sounds young, right? 15 years old, but I looked up when boys tend to hit puberty, and I found 9 to 14 years old, which makes 15 actually a strong, agile age for a boy entering adulthood okay so i'm sticking with five six as well 170 centimeters because that's the average height of a 15 year old japanese or even a korean boy and you know being slim slender and fit will help him go through that bathroom window as the police suggested even though my guy that i'm gonna talk about isn't entering through there now back to why I think it's a young person okay because it's you know after all this killer serial killer origin stories that we've heard right they eventually graduate from mutilating stray cats right hearkening back to you know what happened in 1999 at the park where people were finding mutilated stray cats and um, you know they would graduate from that you know animals to wanting to do it to humans right and at 15 when your testosterone is 30 times more now I think it was just that time where his willpower wasn't enough to stop his urges okay so here's the part of the story that I didn't hear anyone write about and that was the time the killer snuck in now if you think about it 
So everything I read had the killer sneaking in, you know, while the family was at home, you know, at around 9 p.m. and afterwards. But what about the 5 to 7 p.m. gap in which all of the family was away, right? Mikio and Ray were out shopping and Sasuko was picking up pictures. A two-hour window of opportunity. So... The kid is surveilling the house, okay? So if what the neighbors were saying is true, that they saw a man pretending to just walk by the Miyazawa house, I would say that's the kid surveilling the home, right? Of course. And the kid would know that the house is near this skateboard park. Now, I believe that the kid is not a skater, but he felt he needed to put together an apparel that would allow him to fit into that skater environment so as not to garner any type of attention. Now, remember that the Tokyo police had to rule out every skater they could question. And one point stuck out to me at least, and that was the fact that to actual skaters, it did not look like skater clothes. It looks like more of a person putting together something that they thought looked like skater clothes. So basically with this disguise, the kid could walk around, you know, the park area without being noticed. So we also learned that skaters, they skated when they wanted to skate. That would, that's what caused a lot of noise complaints, right? So it's safe to assume that there are still people at the park around 9 p.m and maybe even afterwards. Even if they weren't skaters, it could be just people hanging out at the park. So why would this kid choose to go through the back bathroom window when that is directly facing this park where people could just see it? And it's not like he could just jump up and climb in the window. So I really don't think the kid would risk, you know, being seen entering this bathroom window. And considering the gymnastics he had to do to even get up there and in, well, that would have taken some time and the odds of being seen would have grown with each passing second. So because there were footprints below the bathroom window, I, I believe it was only because the kid was there, standing below there and realizing how impractical it was to go in that way. So how did I think he got in? Okay, so I read a bunch of Reddit threads. Okay, I know that's not a great source of information, but it can lead you into a lot of sources of information. This is how I found the Faceless Podcast in the first place, by the way. And it was a post by Nick himself, and, you know, to help the community better understand the case, and he would even debunk certain things, like the fact that the phone line was said to have been cut by the killer, right? Like it was pre-planned, like a smart killer or whatnot. Turns out that the detectives, long time ago, had already discarded that myth the phone lines worked fine and Nick had what he called a working theory that the killer might have climbed on top of the family car and up the balcony and that would lead him right into Ray's room and I'm liking this because no one at the park could see him and don't forget the neighborhood had dwindled down to about four homes at this time so I'm stealing this from you, Nick. I'm adopting this for my working theory, so thanks again. Also, I forgot to mention, the bathroom window was analyzed and there were no foreign fibers found around it and considering how small it was, there was just no way someone was climbing through, no matter how skinny, you know, without at least scraping the edges, especially when the culprit was wearing this giant green fanny pack with a long sashimi knife inside. So now I have to think and come up with a reason why the window was open and the net removed. I already have that. So now I have the killer climbing up through the balcony way. And of course there's a door there, it's probably locked. I'm just gonna say that the killer knows how to pick a lock and get himself in. And since nobody was home at this time, you know, a little bit noisy probably didn't matter as much and the room with the most footprints was that room that ray was in okay now you got to think about it the room that would track the most footprints would be the initial room that the killer goes into you know with his dirty shoes i believe that once he was in 
he snooped around a bit and then patiently hid in that very room. We all know that Mikio, he was still alive at 10.38 p.m. because he logged into his password protected email, meaning at that time, it was most likely him settling down after saying goodnight to his family. So Ray was snug in his bed and, you know, mom and daughter were in the attic. And so when the lights were off and the house got quiet, this is when the kid comes out of hiding and strangles Ray. So as he feels the child's life leave his body, I think the kid's bloodlust is quenched, okay? I think at this point, he just wants to get out of there and realizes now that someone is downstairs, so he can't just go leaving the same way that he had come in. This is when he figures he'll use the bathroom to get out. So he goes into the bathroom, he opens the window and he knocks out the net. And then he realizes how impractical, if not impossible, getting out that way without falling two stories is, he abandons it, but he's already knocked out the net and it hits the ground with a thud. This is what I think Mikio hears and comes up the stairs to investigate. Now, the kid, knowing he just made a loud noise, rushes out of the bathroom to find another hiding spot, but he runs into Mikio. So he pulls out that sashimi knife, which is not a good knife to bring for an attack. That's why I believe this kid probably only brought that knife. It's a long, thin knife, right? So he only brought it as an intimidation factor if he needed it but he wound up using it okay so he attacks mikio and we know what happens there now like the story goes the kid hears something coming from the attic and so he goes up there and he attacks you know yasuko and nina now here is where i really believe that the killer is somewhat of a young age you know a kid and probably doesn't have grown man strength yet if you see where i'm going he pretty much loses to Yasuko and retreats. Remember, Yasuko has enough power left, along with pure adrenaline of course, to carry her mortally wounded child, Nina, down the stairs to try to escape. So, in this scenario, it's a serial killer's first attempt, and he succeeded beyond his imagination. He got the kill with Ray but wound up being caught and simply went on a rampage and killed the rest of the family. Bringing a knife that wasn't good for killing shows that it wasn't well thought out. Now there is the fact that the knife was wrapped in the black handkerchief, you know, in a manner not done by Japanese people, done by fish workers, right, from China. But who said that he wrapped it? Could it be that it was his father or someone he knew, someone he was related to that worked at a fish-related job or he simply stole the knife, you know, wrapped and all, you know, it seems plausible to me at least. So now the odd behavior after these killings makes a little bit more sense if the killer was young, you know, and an inexperienced killer. I mean, after bandaging his wound, he eats ice cream. He proceeds to leave DNA everywhere, as well as taking a dump in the toilet, not flushing, and the police, they would analyze that poop. And it was deduced that it was conducive, I guess the recipe, of a home-cooked meal, like mama would make. And regardless, the behavior of the killer was nonsensical at best. Even the folder he created on Mikio's computer, pointless. He used the mouse, but there was no indication that the killer ever even touched the keyboard. Of course, it's a Japanese keyboard. Maybe he couldn't read Japanese, or maybe he was simply illiterate. Was the killer even from Japan, or was he just a tourist kid on holiday? Was his father part of Edwards Air Force Base? Was he an American Air Forcer? Air Forcer. So if this is the case, did the kid then go back home and tell his parents a lie about how he got the wound, why his clothes are different, and he would be taken to the hospital for, you know, that's a pretty deep gash, and deep wound, and that was that. So if my scenario, I guess, touches base with reality in any way, I'm pretty sure the parents would know that their kid's story is bullshit, right, when they take him to the hospital, but 
like some parents do they're going to protect their kids no matter what and so the killer would never be caught he and his family would probably board a plane back to america where he might still be relishing that night's memories so quick recap i have an american-born korean around 5 6 roughly 40 years old today vacationed in japan or was stationed with his parents in japan on december 30th of 2000 has a healed wound a gash on his hand take a look at your korean friends <laughs> gashes on their hands and ask yourself hey do you know anyone like that and i'll just leave it at that and hopefully someone will add on and make my story make sense if it doesn't and i haven't outroed in a while so let me just do that now and if you guys remember this is what i used to always say don't forget to protect the ones you love and love the ones that protect you.